You ready to talk about some beginner backpacking mistakes? I'm probably going to piss some people off. Okay, that's that's what this show's all about. Have you seen my thumbnails? <laughs> if anyone says to you, buy right or buy twice, ignore them. Don't drop a bunch of money on gear. I almost feel crazy saying this. Bringing an outfit for every day. Probably don't want to bring that big cast iron pan. <laughs> and I brought half of one tent and half of the other. When we showed up, <laughs> that equals no tent. Taking someone you watch on YouTube too seriously. A hundred percent degree. Ultralight is not expensive. Yes. The whole joke of everything but the kitchen sink. We actually bought a backpacking kitchen sink. Ah, it bugs me. It's the yeah. opposite of clickbait. I'm giving you more than you <laughs> clicked for we're back what's going on everybody welcome to trail tales i my name is kyle o'grady i am a through hiker i'm a I'm a huge hiking nerd and I'm a little rusty. And every single week on this podcast, I chat with other hiking nerds about their experiences on the trail. This is going to be a fun episode. It's not going to be a bummer like last week. And um, I'm just excited to get back into the show here. Uh, on this episode, we're going to have Mr. Syntax77, who, who, it's, who is a previous guest of the show, but from a long time ago. Um, and back in 2020, we had the, uh, we had the opportunity to hike together. Um, and he's just, uh, I, I'm sure I explained it all in the previous episodes we did, but it's been so long now. I just want to say that I was watching Syntax 77 back when I was like wide eyed beginner backpacker, 15, 16 years old. I was probably the only 15 year old watching Syntax 77. Um, we can double check with him in a second. Cause I know he knows his, his channel demographics, but, um, I, I was like a huge fan of his channel. Um, I followed him for so long and then for years before I was making content myself. And then of course I started doing YouTube as well. And that's how we connected. Actually, this podcast is how we connected um, at first. And then we got the chance to hike together and I think we're going to be doing some cool stuff together in the future as well. And so um, one of the OG backpacking YouTubers, he's done so much stuff all over the country and I'm so excited to have him back on the show. Sean, Hello. thanks for doing this, man. How's it going? I'm doing good. It's good to be back. It's been a long time. Yeah. What did we What did we say? Was it three years? Is that what? Is that three what and was? a half? I think it'd be four years in September. The last podcast. In so insane. Yeah. So insane. Like our last one must have been about the Devil's Path hike. Then, huh? Yeah. So I look back over it. We did uh, Devil's Path in like August. And I think we did basically a trail guide podcast in uh, September-ish of so 2020. Crazy. Yeah. 2020. Yeah, I remember this was like, obviously like relatively early COVID. Like, oh man, so crazy. Um, but it, it was such a fun hike and we would have had the chance to hike together just a few weeks ago as well. Um Yes. Some of you that are really in the the backpacking YouTube world, by now you might have seen like a number of YouTubers uh, went on this trip kind of brought together by Outdoor Vitals, and Sean was part of that trip, and I was supposed to go on that trip. They had even booked me a flight. I felt really bad. Like they they had everything lined up for me. I had give them a given them a solid yes, and then um, because my girlfriend broke her leg. I couldn't really just leave her. So I had to be there to help her. And so I ended up having to cancel on them last minute and I wish I could have gone, but that's just the way life goes. But was that trip? Did you have a good time? And, and what's your plan for content for that? Did you end up filming at all? No. So I kind of, I, I did, I did B roll that I can throw back to in uh, probably during one of my trip videos. Um, I'll talk about it and do a throwback. Um, but I really, it was kind of your advice. I just, I don't usually get that social. So, I wanted to kind of focus on meeting people and um, being in the moment. And also, I've never filmed with eight other people with cameras out. So <laughs> I didn't know how to do that with my style. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, yeah. I had some ideas, but it, it probably would have been outside of my normal wheelhouse. So, yeah, yeah. I don't think I would have <clears throat> filmed. I, my plan was to try to do some Trail Tales episodes while I was there and then maybe just take some B-roll on trail to like, kind of, yeah. you know do that but I don't, I don't blame you um i i want to watch everyone's videos from it but i just can't i will eventually but i'm just so bummed i couldn't go i can't i can't bring myself to do it yet like it would like ah that's right yeah. um anyways <laughs> dude you ready to talk about some uh 
beginner backpacking mistakes, some common backpacking mistakes, some uh, yes, some I stuff am. like that. Yes, this sir. Is, this is your first time doing like a list episode with me, right? Yeah. Like all the other ones, we were kind of just cutting it up. No, I'm ready. I got my look. I got my got my list. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Um, and and so. We'll just kind of go back and forth and we'll just kind of talk a little bit about each of our points. And then another thing, too, I just want to say right before we start these is that Sean and I have, I think, a little bit different styles of backpacking, not like drastically like we've definitely have like some good overlap. But, um, you know, I come from more of like the through hiking world. I've still done plenty of shorter weekend hikes and stuff. But um, Sean, that's kind of more his specialty. And I, I guess I don't want to speak for you, too, but. You've done like some other, I know you've done like a little bit of nothing like super crazy off trail, but like some of your like plane going to plane stuff comes to mind. And yeah. I don't know. Um, the reason I bring this up is because we don't know for sure, but there's a chance that we might have a little bit of disagreement about some of these and that's okay. And like, you know, we're not going to oh. just be yes men to each other. No, th- um, that'll make it more fun. I'm ready. Exactly. And maybe there won't be, I don't know. I, I just wanted to say that just to... I didn't basically for everybody listening. I didn't want Sean to feel like he had to just come on here. And like I just gave like the worst advice ever, and he's like, oh, "It's his <laughs> podcast, so I gotta just agree." No, we'll we'll see what we get up to here. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do it. So I'll start. Okay. The first um, beginner backpack mistake, and I think these are ones that we've made, but um, yeah, the, the first one that came to mind for me was um, not packing my gear correctly well and i can think of a few different examples of this and then uh, sean i want to hear if you made this same mistake um and it makes sense you first start out you don't really know exactly the best way to pack your stuff but Mm -hmm. um i would my first couple trips dude i had shit hanging off of my bags (laughs) just like you know rattling around flinging around you see that a lot um obviously there's a certain way you want to pack things in terms of the weight sometimes too. Like maybe you want some heavier items towards the bottom. Um, and then another big one for me was just like, I would, I've talked about this at length in videos. Like I would put important pieces of gear that I wanted accessible throughout the day, like at the bottom of my backpack. And so I, I like bury my rain jacket down there and then it's like starting to rain. So I like frantically am like digging through my pack, like throwing shit to try to get to my rain jacket. Um, you learn pretty quickly that maybe you ought to have that rain jacket outside your pack somewhere you can easily grab it. And so just not packing well, I guess, um, is yes. a, definitely a big mistake that I made when I first started. I don't know. Is that is that something that you experienced as well? Yeah. When I first started, I had no concept of like access to gear. Exactly what you just said. Um, whereas nowadays, like I'll keep my tent um, on the outside of my pack. Not hanging oh. off, but like my, you know, like the the stuffy, stretchy pouch thing on the back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I kind of reserve that for my tent or my tarp if I'm hammock camping. Um, because if it's raining, even if I just want to take a break, like I just want to grab that thing and get at it. That rain jacket and first aid kit I keep on the outside um, in, a, in the outer uh, pocket, I should say. Yeah. Um, no concept of that when I started. Like if it started horrendously raining, I I would have just had to have had a yard sale. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be reaching, <laughs> yeah, exactly, I'd be reaching for the bottom. Yeah, exactly. I had that, man. I had that so many times. And <clears throat> and this is one, and I feel like probably a lot of these are going to be the same way. It's one of the things where it might be hard to really grasp this until you actually get out there. And so I don't know exactly what bullshit title I'm going to use for this, but Knowing me, I'll probably have included something slightly insulting to beginner backpackers in the title. Just to be clear, <laughs> that's all in good fun. Um, you know, this is a very understandable thing for you to not realize until you start. But uh, if you are new and you're listening to this, then you'll have a you'll have a leg up. Um, 100%. Okay, next one. Sean, what's, uh, what's, what's on your list? Top of my list is for beginning, beginner backpackers. <laughs> Not fully appreciating or even being aware of necessarily the concept of base camping, even on a multi-day trip, actual backpacking. Um, but you don't have to move constantly. 
Like you can get, you could go eight miles into a beautiful spot. You could set up camp. And I think one of the toughest, one of the most stressful and time consuming things, at least for me, and I've seen in other people, I think to a certain extent, when you start backpacking is how much time it can take to set up your gear, break down your gear, stuff like that. So it's okay to go five miles in, set up camp, and then maybe your middle day, you don't have to break down camp and get on the trail and then set it all up again. You can actually have a day to just explore the surrounding area and come back. Um, personally, I don't usually do that. I go for loops, but it is something I keep in my back pocket even now. Um, yeah. I have to remind myself sometimes, like, um, this is an awesome area that I hiked into and I am in, you know, the middle of nowhere, at least it feels like it. Um, you, you could just base out of there. And also physically, I think when you first start, I don't care how much you do on the treadmill or push-ups or anything like that. Like there's just, I feel like there's no physical way to prepare for having all that weight on your shoulders and your, hip, and your hips and whatnot. Um, so if, if you can have a middle day where you actually kind of just get away, go out, see some sights, then come back to camp. It's already set up, you know, in your, in your first handful of trips that can really make things more enjoyable. Um, yeah. So that's what I would yeah. say. Don't ignore the concept of having a base camp. This is why you're on the show, dude. That's, that's a great one. And that's something that I would have never thought about, uh, or at least thought to include because, um, when I first started backpacking, I I never really considered this. And to be fair, it is location specific too, right? Because oh, if yeah. you're on just like a straight line trail, like the AT or something like that, yeah. then maybe, unless you're just doing like an out and back, you know, you might not have the option to base camp. But like the place that I first discovered that people do this was when I started hiking in the Adirondacks because it's huge there. Maybe a little bit in the whites as well, but for some reason the Adirondacks, maybe just the way that everything's so dense there in the high peaks um it's you know tons of people do that there and that's when i first learned about it and i was like oh yeah that's that's the the, like purest part of me the ridiculous purest part of me still doesn't like it a little bit (laughs) but um yeah i mean it makes perfect sense it's like if you're gonna especially in a place yeah like the high peaks i mean you can just hike in set up before you start going up the crazy climbs and cliffs and all in cables and stuff and then um there's only a few spots that have cables, but you know what I mean. Yeah, uh, no, and then totally. Do a loop, and that, that's a good one. I, I'm glad you included that. I have to remind myself of that even now. Like, wait a minute, do I really need to be moving constantly? My first backpacking trip ever was only one night, two days. I legitimately walked past my camp. Like, that's where I planned to camp. <laughs> and then I still went to the top of Mount Adams, and this is my – Second backpacking trip ever, first solo trip ever in April okay. with ice, White Mountains. And I took my entire load out up to the top of Adams and then came back down and set up camp. So <laughs> so even if it's not an overnight thing, like just keep in mind, you could set up camp and then do stuff. Yeah. 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 Mount Adams in April for your second yep. backpacking trip. That's bold, dude. That's oh, bold. Oh, stupid. <laughs> I was stupid. I was like, well, it's April. It's going to be warm. It's spring. I'm, you know, this is nine hours north of where I lived. So I didn't quite yeah. comprehend the ice thing until I got there. Yeah, that's crazy, dude. Maybe it's maybe it's good that you had all your like overnight gear with you and you were up there just in case there was like an emergency or something and you needed to to like bug out or something. I don't know. Well, that's, there's a great point to that, too. Sometimes, if you're in a really harsh condition, then you probably want your sleeping bag and all that stuff with you. So, yeah. You know. Yeah, but the but the general like yeah. you know three season more concept of what you're saying it definitely makes sense. That's a good one. I wouldn't have thought about that one. Um, all right, this next one this is a classic one, but it's so important, and this is definitely one that I learned the hard way that I I just wanted to include it, and that would be this this mistake would be pushing yourself just way too hard at the beginning. And then just being miserable and being in pain and not enjoying it and then not wanting to um, continue backpacking because of it or go again after. Um, This is one that I did. I mean, I've told it a lot on the show, but my first like real backpacking trip, I was attempting to through hike the long trail, did not even come close and just 
went too hard out the gate. My second day, we did 17 miles, which now, you know, I could do 17 miles and probably be fine. But back then, That's that a was lot. a lot for me. Yeah. And, and I and I was just destroyed and it, it ended my hike before it even began basically because of that. Um, and so I think this is important and you might be wondering, well, okay, well then how do I know what, how, or, you know, what mileage is going to be too much? How do I know what's going to be too difficult, which is fair. And you probably can't know for certain. There's no like, you know, hard and fast rule for that. But I think the, the best um, guideline to follow and, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, Sean mm-hmm. would be to, Try to try to try your best to plan an itinerary that's that seems reasonable for your abilities, and then dial it back a little bit. Like yes, really, you, you definitely rather err on the side of like I got to camp at two o'clock and I'm bored and I'm not that tired yet, than I hiked way too far and I can't feel my feet and this sucks and I never want to do it again. Um, yes, I don't know. What do you think about that? No, a hundred percent. So I remember one of my earlier backpacking trips, and I also had my wife and two friends and and his wife was it might have been her first or second trip it was the grafton loop but we just we just pushed it too far and every night was like get to camp at night in the dark and i'm kind of down for some weird stuff like pushing the envelope but you could just see them in their face they were just like this sucks like i luckily they continued to backpack but like we were pretty close to uh them being scared away completely and and it was just because we pushed it too far you yeah. know yeah and that's that's a hard trail too like th- that trail is no joke so I-, I could see pushing it too hard on that trail would be not that difficult to be honest yeah yeah what's what's the next one sean all right i got another one for you let me see what i got on my lovely list here <laughs> um okay if anyone you know, this is for like you're real new to backpacking and somebody's trying to get you into it. If anyone says to you the famous phrase of buy right or buy twice, ignore them. I, I'm probably going to piss some people off with this. Um, okay. That's that's what this show's all about. Have you seen my thumbnails? That's, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. Um, there's plenty of people that say this. Um you know, you're going to waste money. You got to buy the best gear from the gate because you're just going to buy it again. Um, but the truth of the matter is, and this is probably maybe uh, a little weird to say on a backpacking podcast, but a lot of you may not go backpacking again. Hopefully you will. And that's probably a small percentage. Um, some of you, at least, you're going to go backpacking less than you think. So the, the person who's telling you that most likely has good intentions. They're trying to save you from going through the process they went through of discovering what they like, and they should have just done it right from the beginning um, and what works for them, but they're not you. And you honestly do not know what works for you yet and what is right. So, and also keep in mind. All right. So uh, I've been hiking since or backpacking since 2011 Two years ago, I think, I finally invested in a really nice pair of carbon fiber like uh, hiking poles. Um, they were like over 150 bucks. I'm almost embarrassed to say that, but <laughs> I really am. But at this point in my life, like I know what I like and I'm into trekking pole tents and I know what works and like I invested in that and I'm going to have them forever. Um, when I first started, you know, 30, a $30 pair of poles was fine. And the buy right, don't buy it twice person would tell you, well, they're going to break in 100 miles. Okay, well, if I go once a year, uh, you know, it's 10 miles a year. Like, it's it's fine. Yeah. And then so for my first like eight years of backpacking, I went through two $30 pairs of hiking poles. Like, it's not the it's it's kind of a cost of doing business. Um, maybe it would turn out that I don't want hiking poles at all. Um, it would be severely irresponsible of me to just make myself feel be- feel better and tell somebody like you need to get these REI yeah. flash poles for 150 bucks or you will not be a hiker. Um, so I would say yes. just be aware of that. Yeah, Sean, this is why we're we're good friends. I <laughs> agree with this so hard, dude, and I've been preaching this. Um, I agree with this so much, and I feel like this is something that's even more worth saying in like the, the age of YouTube and the internet and stuff. 
Um, it certainly held true before that, but nowadays you go on YouTube and you start watching anything related to backpacking. Um, it's all about gear. Like here's the latest and greatest. And I feel like it's easy for people to get sucked into that. And again, I could see somebody just dropping a lot of money on really expensive gear before they're like super into backpacking, which maybe it'll work out and they got themselves a bunch of good gear and they end up liking it, but there's a good chance that it won't. They might go out for their first couple trips and be like, Oh, I don't really enjoy this as much as I thought, or I just won't be doing it as much as I, as much as I want to. And I just dropped two, three grand on a super fancy setup that I probably didn't need to do that, you know? So like, yeah, yeah, dude, I, I agree with this so much. And I've been saying this for a long time. Like, of course you don't want to, there's a line like you don't want to just buy like the worst or the, or the right. sorry the the cheapest stuff yeah. ever maybe like you got to still do some research mm-hmm. um but i would 100 percent recommend like for your first couple trips if you don't if you haven't done it yet don't drop a bunch of money on gear yeah. um get some relatively cheap stuff and then if you go out and you have and i'll put it this way if you enjoy backpacking with cheap kind of shitty gear then just imagine how much you're going to enjoy it once you do actually yes. upgrade to some better stuff um such a good point dude i actually almost included this one on my list but um but i didn't because i didn't make that mistake myself but it's fantastic um okay this next one i guess since we're talking about gear a little bit i'll do a little bit more specific of a gear one I'll be curious to see your thoughts on this. Okay. I can't remember what you do in terms of this piece of gear. So, and, and this is, I'm not a, this isn't anything revolutionary here. You've definitely heard people say this before, but I still think it's worth saying. Um, big mistake that I made when I first started backpacking was using a pack cover instead of mm. a pack liner to keep my gear dry. And And again, maybe you will find some folks out there that still are pro pack cover, but I feel like, for the most part, at this point, people are starting to realize that pack covers don't do as good of a job keeping your gear dry. Now, maybe if you're out west in a place where it doesn't rain very much, I mean, I would still recommend having a full waterproofing anywhere just to be safe. But, um, I mean, I was hiking on the East Coast, obviously, and so I was hiking in rain, and my pack cover just wasn't cutting it because every every pack cover has a giant hole in it. And that's where you put it around your backpack versus if you line your pack with something right. and you seal it up good. I've never once had my gear get wet. Yeah. Um, and I'm talking, did the entire AT with the same trash compactor bag, never switched it out, got rained on a lot, never got my gear wet. It's a pretty foolproof, not 100% foolproof. I guess you could puncture it by accident, but pretty foolproof. And yeah. I just feel like they do a better job than uh, than pack covers do. And and. and The last thing I'll say about this is when you're a beginner, at least speaking for myself anyways, I feel like intuitively you drift towards the pack covers because that's what they're designed to do is keep your packs dry. And I don't know, you just see them and so you're like, okay, this must be what you do versus lining your bag with a trash, but your backpack with a trash bag or something like that, or a trash compactor bag would probably be better or a Nylofoom something that might not be the thing that like jumps out to you when you're first starting to research. And so those are my thoughts. I don't know. How do you, how do you feel about pack covers, Sean? Yeah. So I would say as a new backpacker, I bet you, if you're super new, you, you don't even probably understand the concept that there's, <laughs> I didn't for years. Yeah. Like it was, you go into REI and they have the pack covers and, and that's what you do. In addition to cursing, you're like, but the water, the backpack's not waterproof. I have to pay an extra 40 (laughs) bucks for that whole thing. I will say I do always carry a very light, like few ounce pack cover. It's just permanently attached to my pack. Um, I'll throw it on for like light rain and stuff. Um, But for heavy rain, even with a nice pack cover, um, I've had times where it, it, it the wa- the rain rushes in so hard that on the bottom of the pack cover, like oh. by your butt, it, it fills up with water. And so you don't even know that you're hiking for like four miles in the rain and it's just soaking through the bottom of your pack. Um, so I will admit though, I don't have through hiker uh, credentials, I guess. I've never actually done a trash compactor bag, but oh, okay. I, if I'm expecting rain, 
what I will do is I'll take a like a lightweight garbage bag and I'll I'll I won't exactly line my pack, but like my sleeping bag and like anything that's going to soak up water and like screw up my ability to live is going to go in there. And yeah, and then has that's saved my butt before. Yeah, 100%. I mean the the concept is pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, like especially nowadays, I feel like with um with Dyneema packs and like packs that are pretty waterproof, even without a trash compactor bag, like you combine that with you know just a lightweight compactor bag or one of those. Have you seen those like Nylofoam ones? Nah. They're just like it's just like really lightweight, thin, but but fairly somewhat sturdy, I guess, plastic. Yeah. Um that are just a little bit more shaped for backpacks rather than like a trash bag, which is a little bigger. Um, it's the same thing. Just line your pack with it. Yeah. Like one of those and like a Dyneema waterproof ish pack. I mean, you can't go wrong. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Uh, what's your, what's your next one, Sean? All right. What do we got here? All right. So I'm going to go back to a pretty simple one, but this is like yeah. legit mistake i made and i think i learned this lesson like after my first trip um (laughs) bringing an outfit for every day and maybe you've never done (laughs) this i haven't but i've definitely heard of people doing this or essentially Uh, so my first backpacking trip was not my idea so i was just going with the crowd um now as it turns out the people that got me into it hadn't really backpacked either so we were all completely (laughs) clueless um we legit brought like a pair of pants and a shirt for every day and and maybe that's crazy i almost feel crazy saying this but i know there's got to be somebody out there that as i i mean if four of us did it somebody else has to do it well it makes total sense if you've never backpacked before, you're we used were to on vacation. Tri- <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what you do. So yeah. no, it makes it makes total sense. It was so stupid. Yeah. Um, but there's no need for that. And even if you're like, well, I want clean clothes because I'm around my friends. Well, first of all, they stink too. And on top of that, like you're dirty. Like as soon as as soon as you put on the next thing, like it's probably just as bad within 20 minutes. Like let's be <laughs> honest. Yeah. Um, so I'm super hardcore nowadays. I'm not saying everybody go this route, but I, I really bring doubles of nothing other than maybe socks, depending on like the conditions other than extra layers for warmth. But I would say if you're even going to bring doubles of something like one extra redundancy is fine. If you're really on a longer trip and you're, to, you're to through hikers, so you can probably speak to this more, but like even on a through hike, like you don't need more than a double of an item, like soak it in a stream and put it on your pack and let it dry out. Like you don't need four or just suck shirts. It up. Yeah. Or, or just so, be well, a hundred percent. Yeah. Don't even bring the deodorant. It's a waste of time. But if you, uh, <laughs> I really don't think you need a t-shirt for every day. And I, I will admit that I did that once. Hey, well, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're not hiding from it, Sean. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. I'm owning my truth. Let's get a little bit specific then. So let's say, we're, you're on a three season hike, okay? Just for like just one of your one of your normal hikes, say three three days, four days, two days, something in that range. We'll say we'll say, we'll say three days, two nights. Um, okay. Three season, you're not expecting temperatures below like you know forty degrees. Say, perfect. Um, what do you br- like? What do you bring in for clothing? Like everything, like packed and worn. I'm um, okay. So not go- We're talking not going below forty. Decent. It might rain, might not, but nothing too crazy. Um, yeah. I'm not bringing extra. Nowadays, I'm not bringing extras of anything. Really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I will say a, a, a spare pair of socks to sleep in is good because you don't want wet, wet feet at night. Um, other than that, I'm rolling synthetic on everything and I just deal with it. Um, I usually am moving around a lot at camp at the end of the night and in synthetics in those kind of temperatures, um, I'm probably going to be pretty dry by the time I go to bed. Um, so I take those socks off. Maybe I put the warm ones on. Um, but that's it. I really don't bring, and and this is one of those things that I definitely, this is what I do, but I don't necessarily recommend it because it's, it sounds kind of reckless. Like, yeah, maybe you should have a spare or something, but I've never 
I've been doing that for years. I've never really needed anything else. And I'm just doing mm-hmm. weekend warrior, like like you said, three, four days. Yeah. 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 But when you think about it, like a third hike, it's kind of just a bunch of weekend length trips broken down for the most part. Um, I mean, you know, maybe you're getting five days in there, sometimes longer, but um in terms of like clothing my weekend setup usually isn't really much different than it is when I'm through hiking. So, so you don't, you don't have any extra clothing to sleep in then? <laughs> no. Nice. No, I'm a dirt ball. Nice. I sleep in the same thing. Yeah. I sleep a lot in of people thing. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, now my wife is the, totally different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things where like, when I think about how I can save more weights, cause I, I feel like I've come up against like my limit of how much weight I can save. And mm-hmm. I haven't really been able to go beyond it for a few years now. And when I think about a way that I potentially could, it would be ditching my sleeping clothes and just sleeping in my hiking clothes. But yeah, I just I just can't bring myself to do it for some reason. I know ton, you're not alone. Like a lot of people do that, and I don't think it's you use the word reckless there. I I don't think it's reckless. I think it just might be a little more uncomfortable. But if you can tolerate that, then yeah, why not? And but yeah, and I don't know. Bring the right clothing that you know. There's certain clothing that, like I said, dries quicker and feels cleaner and more comfortable so yeah just kind of play it by ear are you do you sweat a lot like are no you i don't so that's probably a major advantage to that yeah it definitely is strategy like, yeah i just cannot imagine like on the at dude, i just sweat so much like i cannot imagine that's, sleeping yeah. in the same shirt that i wore all day i mean yeah. even if it dries right which it probably would like it's still just so gross even after just a yeah. i don't know though this there are lots of people that do it, so yeah. who knows? Um, that's a good one, though. We're straying a little bit. I mean, I guess, actually, since I asked you, my the setup that I've been rocking for a while in terms of clothing is shirt to hike in, shorts to hike in, mm-hmm. um, two pairs of socks, and then I'll usually bring a base layer shirt to sleep in and a pair of long underwear to sleep in. Um, I like to have all my skin covered. This is really is quite different than you i guess um i like to have all my skin covered because my legs especially get like sticky and then i find it is uncomfortable for me to sleep when my legs are like sticking together like i like to have some fabric there to prevent that yeah um plus it keeps you a little warmer too Mm -hmm. um and then i'll have like a down jacket and a rain jacket but i guess that's i'm usually not sleeping in my rain jacket but that's generally what i do but i probably could for especially for solid like summer hiking like i probably could ditch the sleeping clothes and just at least the top one, maybe I could just go shirtless. I don't know. I'm really yeah. trying to save a couple ounces here, but yeah, who knows? <laughs> 100%. Um, all right, dude. Uh, I guess it's back to me then. Um, okay. This is a, this is an interesting one. Kind of goes along with some of the stuff we've talked about, but another gear one, um, this mistake would be not realizing. And this is definitely an understandable one. I'll preface it. By saying that, um, this mistake would be not understanding the difference between backpacking gear and just camping gear, which, and and if that confuses you, if you're new listening to this, if you're like, if that confuses you, hopefully I can help Um, because I could, I could see how that could be kind of confusing because you're like, but you're camping. So what's the difference? And it gets even more complicated too, because some gear you can use for backpacking and camping. And then there's some gear that probably wouldn't want to use for camping or, or maybe actually the other way around more, you probably wouldn't want to use it for backpacking, but if you're just car camping, then it's fine. Um, I guess I should start there by camping. I'm talking about more like car camping. Like you don't have to carry it on your back. You can just throw shit in your car, throw it in a bin, and then you're setting up camp right next to where your car is. Um, there is a difference. Like there are, There's plenty of gear out there that is perfectly fine for car camping. Um, Even backpacking like things like a tent or a sleeping bag. Um, There's plenty of those things that are fine for car camping, but you would not want to take backpacking because they're just too bulky or too heavy or just too much of a pain um, to deal with. And I think people get confused between those those things sometimes. Um, And it also makes sense if you're new and you're not again. You're not trying to go out and just blow your budget out. Um, you might be like, "Oh, well, I already have a tent, and so I'll just bring that." But um, <laughs> yeah. that tent might be six, seven ten. pounds, sometimes more, <laughs> ten yeah. pounds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that is that. 
it's hard, but you do have to think about like what that limit of like, okay, maybe this, this gear item is just not practical to take backpacking. Um, tents and sleeping bags are the ones that, and maybe sleeping pads too are the ones that come to mind the most, but then even other things like pots, like cookware, even potentially you probably don't want to bring that big cast iron pan (laughs) um, (laughs) that that you would use to cook over the fire. I I don't know. What what do you, what do you think about this, Sean? No, you're a hundred percent correct. And I'm, I'm, so as you were saying that, I was trying to like think back to my first backpacking trip that I was drug into and I had no concept of weight. I mean, I knew all this stuff had to be on my back, but yeah, I didn't, I definitely did not discern the difference between the two. Now, when we eventually got to the trip, I, I thankfully figured it out, although I still was terrible at it. I brought so much crap, <laughs> so much crap. Um, but yeah, like even just like the, 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 re- the perfectly rectangular Coleman sleeping bag. It's like perfect for car camping, but like, that's like your entire <laughs> backpack. <laughs> yeah right you know what i mean but exactly. like it doesn't it doesn't think compress about it. at all and yeah. it's probably not that warm either let's be honest no no and it's all cotton you know <laughs> yeah yeah oh that's another yeah the material even you know yeah. i was kind of focusing on the weight and the size there but the material even mm-hmm. um or just like the specs because like if you're back you know st- or the, 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 sticking to the sleeping bag example it's like you know it, it that that a car camping a cheap car camping sleeping bag might not even have a temperature rating on it and yeah. um, if it does it might not be the most accurate but if you're car camping and you get a little cold that's okay you can just you probably packed a couple extra blankets or some some uh, yeah. bulky layers you'll probably be okay but if you're backpacking you, you you obviously don't have those resources or as many resources at your disposal to compensate for that so that's a that's a good example for sure but sorry I kind of cut you off there. No, I think I I must have cl- completed my thought because that's I know I think that's all I had. Yeah, I mean but, I'm sure we could cherry pick lots of different examples, but um that's a yeah the, the the sleeping bag seems to be the one I come back to the most. Um, what's your what's your next mistake, Sean? All right, so this one I'm going to say, and you know what, this is not because it's I've been a victim of this. This is me looking back, and I've done it to other people. Okay. Um, but you're new to backpacking and most likely, I mean, there's plenty of people that just are like, I want to do it and they go out on their own. But a lot of times you have like, I wouldn't call it a mentor, but it's like somebody else that is like, Hey, you want to come backpacking? Um, and they kind of get you into it. Maybe they provide you with some gear advice and whatnot. Um, maybe all your gear for the trip, except for your clothing. Um, don't let someone else pack for you. (laughs) <laughs> or if you do, ideally, go to their house, be there with them while they pack. At the very least, because I've done this for people. I'm like, because I have three copies of every gear you can think of. Um, I'll make a pack for someone. But like, at least set up a date to go over, unpack that pack, look at what stuff is in there. Um because there's been times where I've done that for people and then I'm trying to do them a favor, but you get on the trail and it's already stressful enough for that person. Um, but now you're at camp for the first time and like, you're like, what's this thing? Um, yeah. You know what I mean? And then on, you just don't have that comfortability. And also in my case, like I might be looking out for somebody. And so that person is trying to look out for your best interest, but they have their own preferences. And then you get there and you realize like, well, I should have had maybe a different version of this gear or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the the worst version of this, of course, is it's always good, even if you're not a beginner, um, if you're doing a collaborative group backpacking trip, um, at the very least, text like three times about what you're bringing. Um, <laughs> because in my case, like I'll pack for my wife a lot. And uh, infamously, like a couple years ago, I had uh, a, a situation where I brought I packed everything for us and I brought half of one tent and half of the other. <laughs> and so when we showed up, that equals no tent. Um, oh, and, geez. Yeah. So thankfully, my wife is very forgiving and she still backpacks, but that could probably put a damper on things. So I would say <laughs> if you have a helpful friend, still be involved in the process so that you're comfortable and equipped when you get out there. Yeah. Or even something as subtle as like, you take a break 
and they're looking for a certain gear item and they don't know where it is because yeah. they packed it for them. I could see that being something too. So this is one I've not thought about at all, to be honest, because I, I don't think I've ever had somebody pack for me and I don't think I've ever, I've packed for people before, but I think they've always been there and I was kind of like guiding them maybe. And right. so that's obviously different than, than what you're saying. Yeah, so. no, I've packed for people when I'm with them, but like to your point that you just brought up, like, Oh, it's, it's time to, we're going to cook a hot meal on the trail. And then they're just like, I have a spoon. Where is it? Like, you know, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's an interesting one. Or, or, or <laughs> I guess it's similar to yours. Um, that I did, I packed for a friend over the summer and when it came time to eat, we realized that I had forgotten to pack a spork or eating utensil for either one of us. Nice. <laughs> and, and then, and then you feel like a real dick. Cause it, cause cause it's on you. I guess, I guess he was there when I packed, but also like, you know, I was the one guiding it and giving him the gear, most of the gear anyways. And so yeah. then not only do you feel like an idiot for getting for forgetting your spork, but then you feel like an ass for making this guy, this poor guy eat with yeah. a stick just yeah, like yeah. you. So <laughs> at least you're in it together. <laughs> good. Yeah. He was a good sport about it. And thankfully it was like a, it wasn't like a soupy meal. It was like, I forget Mac and cheese or something like that. So it wasn't like, I don't know how you'd eat soup with a stick. You'd have to, I'm sure there's a way. That, that is slowly, I mean, very slowly. Yeah. I think it's a or form I guess of torture. Could just drink it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't even like <laughs> soup that much anyway. So anyways, um, okay. So my, my next one. Okay. Definitely want to hear your thoughts on this one, Sean. Um, right. I'm sure you'll have some. So this piece of advice might sound a little uh, contradictory. Um, or th This um, beginner mistake would be taking someone you watch on YouTube or anybody else for that matter that you talk to that gives you advice, taking, yeah, anybody else's advice or opinion on either gear or just anything related to trail too seriously and the way i think i was really thinking about like youtubers specifically when i thought of this one but then i realized it could kind of work for non-youtubers as well but the we'll just we'll just run with that example for the moment it's like i get messages and comments and emails and stuff from people that are new and, and are, are trying to learn and Sometimes it can be easy to get sucked in to one person's advice and just take that as gospel, but you'll quickly realize the more you backpack that everybody has different preferences, um, especially when it comes to gear, but even just in terms of like what trails are the best trails, what conditions are the most fun to hike in, mileage, all these different things. It's all so personal and subjective that, um, you know, there's so many different YouTube channels out there that like, talk about things from an expert perspective. And, and I'm not saying that they don't know what they're talking about, but I think it's just important to take all of that stuff with a grain of salt. And I think maybe a, the best way to kind of conclusively sum this up, I've said this before, is um, you will learn, you'll learn more from one night on the trail than you will from a hundred nights of binge watching backpacking YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. uh, you really will. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll learn that maybe this piece of gear that works for your favorite YouTuber that they're always raving about doesn't work for you. I've gotten those messages plenty. They're like, Kyle, dude, you always recommend this piece of gear, but I use it and it sucks. Um, and that's, and that's fine. You know, yeah. that's, you, you just can't take anybody, anybody's opinion as gospel. So yes. I don't know. How do you that, feel about that, Sean? A hundred percent degree. Uh, agree to the hundred percent degree. Um, yeah, it's very true. There's something about, so you watch somebody on YouTube, television, whatever, and um, enough. And like, you do kind of get that mentality that like, this is how you do it. Because especially like nowadays, like you just binge, you find a good backpacker, you binge their stuff. And it kind of gets in your head, even more so than if you had a friend that was like very opinionated, because at least they're not there in your face when you're trying to go to sleep at 2 a.m. and you're watching <laughs> videos like they are in your head. Yeah. But it really yeah. is a separate, different person. Um, and I, I think ultimately there's a lot of education you can get from the YouTube videos, but it is ultimately like entertainment um, blended in there at least. 
And it's not crazy that like what they do isn't going to work for you completely. Like if I love hammocks on the East coast and I do a bunch of videos on that because that's what I'm doing. Like that doesn't go for it. Like try it. Like that's awesome. But like, there's a good chance that tents are better for you or whatever the case may be. Um, So yeah, keep it in mind. You're your own person. Definitely. And and you, you hinted at this there as well. This isn't to say that you shouldn't, uh, I mean, I, I gave the example, like, I'm not saying that these people don't know what they're talking about, but also that doesn't mean that there is no value in watching this stuff either. Obviously, I still think it's definitely worth your time to watch people's videos, to research, to do these things. I did all that stuff. That's how I found Syntax 77 back in the day. Um, and, and you can definitely take some inspiration. Just don't take it. I guess I already said this. Don't take it as gospel, I guess. Yeah. And sorry, my camera's shaking. Um, be open to doing things differently than yeah. your favorite YouTuber. Um, and that doesn't mean they're wrong, and it doesn't mean you're wrong if you want to do it differently. No, um, I, I would say it's like researching anything else. Like if you're truly using it for research, like cross-reference. Like I wouldn't go out and just read one article on how to do whatever. Like yeah. I'd read three to five articles, and then I would kind of see what kind of works for me or make my own opinion. Same thing with YouTube videos. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And for for a lot of you watching, you're going to be like, yeah, no shit. But um, <laughs> I'm telling you, but man. you get sucked I, into I get these, it. Yeah. And I get these messages. I see the comments. And so uh, this might be something that a lot of you that don't make content might not have really considered. But it is it is true that people get kind of. Yeah. Um, I think you should have one more, right, Sean? Yes, I do. OK, let's let's hear it. All right. Ultralight is not expensive. Yes. It's not. Preach. I thought we were going to have like these disagreements and stuff. I mean, I, you've been on the money with every single one of these. So the last, what, what do you mean? Maybe the last pound is expensive. Okay. Um, I think the big deal is like people see like the Dyneema um, uh, shelter tent whatever yeah it's 600 bucks yeah that's insane that's when you're saving the last pound or maybe even ounces but you know the 90 percent of saving weight to be ultralight which by the way i don't even really care about i i would say weight conscious is what i am i used to be so into like that number of like getting under 10 like i really don't care anymore but but (laughs) i do understand that like it's good to have a goal like i'm a nerd too so i was really into like i gotta get under 10 but the 90% of being weight conscious and having a good time without getting crushed on the trail is just omitting items, which also goes back to my thing with the, um, how much people get scared away by how much they spend. You could actually buy a couple, you could put a little extra money into whatever gear you want, backpack, tarp, whatever, but you're not buying all the extra crap. Like when I first started, I think I said this on one of your previous podcasts as well, but like that's okay. the whole joke of like everything but the kitchen sink, like we went to REI and we actually bought a backpacking kitchen sink. <laughs> like it unfolded and you put water in it and your dishes. Like, so the money that we spent on that and the weight that it was like, we could have just, we could have just gotten maybe a weight conscious backpack and not for all that, all that crap. But the main thing is, it's just it's just the mentality of like, do I really need uh, going back to the the eight pairs of um, pants or whatever? Um, just omitting items. Um, and years ago, I actually it was not the intent to be ultralight, but I did a thing on um, budget backpacking. Like, here's a two hundred and fifty dollar limit, and I bought everything I could. Mm-hmm. The goal was money, um, but because I had a budget, I couldn't buy a bunch of weird stuff like fancy stuff sacks like no you just shove that kind of restricted to just the necessities yeah and it came in at like 10 point something pounds wow yeah there you go so it's not expensive it's expensive to 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 really get into it and go for it but at that point you've probably been backpacking for a number of years and it's just a hobby so all good Yeah. yeah dude i don't even know if i can add anything to that i i agree with this so much um I guess 
the the only thing I'll say is like, in, not that you didn't you covered this too already, but like, yes, it can be expensive, but people forget that the. Uh, I mean, you you exactly already said this like. A lot of the ways that you save weight is by not bringing things. And by in principle, that means you're not spending money on things because you're right. not bringing them and you don't need them. Right. Um, and I guess another thing, too, is like you alluded to there, there are plenty of budget options out there. Um, and again, you, you won't be able to have the lightest ever set up, but you can still have a super light setup. Um is that a is that an official term? I should be careful what I'm saying here. It's super, super light. light? Is that like a, is I think like you a just sub? created that. It's <laughs> super light is um is under three pounds base weight. Yeah, it's, this is gonna be some guy that spends way too much time on Reddit. It's like uh technically uh that's not super light, actually. Super light is under three point six five yeah, pounds, whatever. Um no. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a definition. I, I feel like people have gravit. I mean, am I wrong in this? But or maybe it's because I don't care. But I feel like there was a peak <laughs> like eight to five years ago where people were super obsessed. I feel like they're reversing a little bit. Like I don't think people are cutting the heads off their toothbrushes anymore. Like there's a little one, bit one, more of one a person at least comfort. still is. But sure, um, <laughs> he's an know. idiot. You don't want to listen to him. This podcast sucks. But um, I. I yeah, maybe maybe you're right, and maybe part of that is this is the this is where we get in trouble, Sean, because the people that All spend right. more time researching <laughs> than us are going to be like, anyways, uh, maybe part of it is now there's so much good ultralight gear out there that people yeah. have the room to add a few extra things back because everything else is so light now. You're um, right. That's a possibility. I don't. I don't know. You're but right. I, I think I've noticed that a little bit too. That people are sliding, not leaping, but sliding back. But yeah, back when I started, you did have to make a conscious decision to kind of go against the grain and be light. And you're right. Like nowadays, I think you could almost accidentally fall into ultralight ish territory just because the the gear is so much more evolved. So, hmm. yeah, um, I just thought of one more point about about this that I want to make um, about ultralight not necessarily being expensive. Um, I, I do think it's important to acknowledge that it probably will take a little bit more work and research to not blow your budget out. Like it'd be probably easier if you wanted to save weight to just go and buy, you know, the cottage, whatever stuff that's like super lightweight and expensive. Um, I, I, I don't want to make it sound easy to get like a 10, 11, 12, whatever lightweight pound base weights that's not expensive. Like you are going to have to probably put in some work there in terms of like researching and stuff, but it certainly can be done and lots of people do it. And so I think that's the overall, the overall point there. And I think that's a good one, Sean. So yeah, all your points were good, dude. This was great. Yeah, man, that was fun. We got through the five. Yeah, we did. Um, I'm just going to hit on a couple extra, some bonus ones real quick. It's the yeah. opposite of clickbait. I'm giving you more <laughs> than you clicked for. That's right. And then Sean's going to tell a story. Yeah. Um, just some other real quick ones. Uh, relying too heavily on all trails is a mistake I see people mm. making all the time. Maybe this is more for like day hiking, maybe not necessarily backpacking, but um, all trails is a... I've really been critical of all trails in the past. I've come around a little bit. It can be a great resource, but you should just always cross reference. You can't just rely on all trails because every now and again, not most of the time, but every now and again, the trail you're trying to hike will not exist or something will be off. Um, and so just look at more than just all trails, but you don't have to avoid it. Just don't rely on it too much. Um, actually, this next one was, Spending too much money on gear before you even know that you like backpacking. We already covered that. There you go. Um, great minds think alike, my friend. And this one we also somewhat touched on. This this mistake would be... It's a little different. Um, I feel like a lot of the time beginners, they they think of like REI or maybe like backcountry.com. These like really big realtors, they think of those as like the holy grail of backpacking gear. And so they think that... They, they don't think beyond REI's website or they walk into the store physically and they just get everything there and they think that they need to get everything there. Maybe this is changing a little bit. Maybe like Amazon too now would be included in that. I'm sure a lot of people are looking on Amazon too. But like my point here is like don't only rely on REI and, you know, popular stores because um, 
there's lots of great cottage gear out there and yeah. uh some of it is quite expensive, but there's a lot of stuff that's still quite affordable too that you're not going to find at REI. You're not going to find on Amazon. And so it's important to to look into that. And food um, too, not to cut you off, but that was almost- Oh, no, you're good. You're good. That was almost one of my things was food. And it took me a long time to figure out like, because it's just like, I'm going backpacking. I'm getting backpacking food. But like, you can bring normal food. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's if a it's great cal- one, If it's calorie dense- And reasonable, or even if it's not, but I mean, like a lot of times there's like, there's food at your supermarket that is not a lot different for $2 compared to 13 bucks for, you know what I mean? Like mountain house, I, I, I'm very nostalgic. I love a lot of mountain house meals, mountain house, mac and cheese. I mean, it's mac and cheese. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like stuff like that. Annie's is better. Annie's is the superior mac and cheese. Boil some water. You're good to go. Couple bucks. So, yeah. yeah. And it tastes great. Have you had Annie's before? I have. Yeah, they're good. Yeah. Yeah. Fun fact about Annie's. Um, this kid that I grew up with and I'm still pretty good friends with from uh, Jericho, Vermont, is dating. And I would imagine they'll probably get married. They've been together for a while. The daughter of the Annie that started Annie's Mac and Cheese. And like I, I loved Mac and Cheese forever. Like I've loved it. Or Annie's Mac and Cheese for so long. It, Specifically Annie's, like over everything else. And then I've known him and his girlfriend for a long time, obviously. And then I found out like long after I had met her and known her and stuff that she was Annie's daughter. I was like, what? That's crazy. So oh, shout I, out Trent. I hope you get Trent hooked Molly. up with some mac and cheese. <laughs> I know, right? I think she invented smart food too. Anyways. Um last one. Uh this one is a me thing. This is a mistake that I'm I'm calling it a mistake. A lot of people wouldn't even call this a mistake. A lot of very experienced and competent people would not call this a mistake, but trekking pole straps. I know, Sean, you don't use trekking poles a ton, but um, how do you put your hand through the straps when you use them? You know what? Now you mention it. So I said I finally invested in those ridiculously expensive ones. Um, I don't think they have straps on them. Oh, okay. They actually yeah, don't. Yeah, I know you're not really... I remember talking about this on Devil's Path. Like you're not really too much of a trucking pole guy. No, I bring them now because my my favorite tent and um, is a trekking pole tent. And so it, it really kind of is just like, why not? Because they do come in handy. Um, but the only ones I had with straps were winter ones, like back in the day oh, okay. for snowshoeing. Mm-hmm. I feel like so, I was always weirded out by putting my hands through them. So this is what I'm saying. So many people either don't use the straps or they they don't use them correctly, which I think, it, but apparently I'm not correct, but I don't know. Like when you put your, so picture the strap. I wish I just had it with me right now so I could demonstrate on camera, but I always put my hand like up through the loop yeah. and then, it, so it kind of like supports your hand and, oh. and then your, your wrist. And so you almost don't even have to grip the pole. Oh, like that tightly. you kind of like a lot this. of the leverage comes from your wrists on the strap, actually not the actual gripping of the pole. And I like it a lot. I feel like it makes it so much easier to use them. And so many people like that have done thousands of miles, like flossy either don't use the straps at all, or they put them in the other way and like, they're not getting any leverage. So they're not, so, so- Ah, it bugs me. <laughs> so the problem is, and I've always viewed it as a, I don't want to lose my trekking poles, but it's actually a functional supportive thing going on. I think so. It makes them way easier to use. Yeah. I will say that I've talked about this on, on YouTube before, and I had a few people commenting saying it's dangerous to do that because you could like break your wrist if you fall a certain way. That's but what I picture in my, my dark mind is that I'm going to yeah, fall and kill myself. <laughs> I don't know. Though. I just feel like that's how you're. And the way that they're shaped, usually I feel like, I don't know. If anyone actually knows the answer to this, leave yes. a comment. I'm not changing the way I do it because I, once you start doing this, like I'm telling you, you get so much better leverage. It's so much more comfortable. You don't have to actually grip the pole that tight. It's nice, but that's just me. That's just me. Who knows? Um, right. It's probably good that I saved that one for last. <laughs> uh, You're changing lives. I, I mean, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, do you have a story? Do you have a story for us, Sean? End of the episode? Yeah, I do. So I had to go back and um, I was like, all right, so what videos do I have since we last talked and uh, jogged my mind? So I, uh, so it's not a story I've told before on previous episodes. Um, <clears throat> so I'll tell you about the time that I had 
the best cheesesteak of my life, and it was a catalyst for the creepiest experience that I've ever had on the trail. Okay. Which is strange. Um, <laughs> but so when when we were on the podcast before, I think I just done that uh, trip where I went and looked for that bomber in New York, um, the airplane. So mm. not long after that, I went up looking for another one. In New Hampshire, outside of Berlin, there was a Douglas DC-3 that went down like 1950-something, 1954. It's actually not that far from the Appalachian Trail. Um, oh, okay. Um, I think it's less than a mile off the trail. Like, if you go in fair weather conditions, like, it's not – it's a completely different experience. Um, but I decided to do it in winter. Um, <laughs> and I also decided that I was going to bring up <clears throat> – shout out to Philly um, – because it's winter, so you can bring meat, right? So I brought a whole thing of steakums, like the shaved ribeye steak, uh, mm. a whole packet of Amarosa rolls, a couple pounds of cheese, uh, some whole <laughs> onions, and um, <clears throat> set off by myself with the idea of that would be my food, and then I'll go look for this plane. <clears throat> pardon, pardon me. Um, so I get up there, and um, I camp the first night, base camp types of uh, situation and the next morning i get up and it's you know it's new hampshire winter it's frigid cold but i'm yeah. super excited that i brought in all my stuff including my fry pan uh not cast iron but you know aircraft aluminum brought in my fry <laughs> pan and uh i start my day off making cheesesteaks like chopping onions putting them on the buns the whole thing Little did I know that that was going to be so much fun that, you know, sunset is like 4.30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and my goal is I still have maybe three miles from camp to go up the trail, then off the trail and look for it. And there's probably four to six feet of snowpack. I mean, it's New Hampshire. Um, yep. So I keep eating these cheesesteaks, uh, just living my dream, listening to the podcast. And like it is – I don't even know what time it was. But it's it's well <laughs> afternoon. It's probably like one something. I'm like, no big deal, three miles. Well, I get on the trail and then I swear by the time I got to the – close to the turnoff where I had to go look for this plane because the whole body is there. It's crazy. Um, wow. It's already getting dark. Um, actually it might've actually been completely dark. Um, so I got the snowshoes and the, and my poles with the straps. Um, and at this point it's after dark, I'm trying to film a video and, um, it's just pitch black and I'm just trudging around through snow banks, falling into little <laughs> mini spruce traps. Ooh. I, I don't even know. It had to be an hour plus it felt like hours it probably was multiple hours because i was just searching around in the snow for this it's a pretty big plane um <laughs> not super huge like 747 but it's a big plane that went down um on this uh mountain and uh it was almost to the point where i was just like well this sucks like i'm gonna have to like leave and come back like i'm just out in the dark with my headlamp and uh right around the point that i was about to give up it's so dark, no moon or stars or anything. It's just dark and overcast. Um, I'm just walking and just picture just like ink, just black. And then just like in front of my face out of nowhere is just a fuselage. Gray fuselage oh, wow. of this airplane. And it was, I, I, I'm not even finding words to describe it, but it was the creepiest thing I've ever encountered. Yeah. Just completely alone. And then just history smacks you in the face. Oh man. It was so weird. And, and then, you know, you go up inside of it and looking around and. Oh, at night, dude. Oh. Yeah. And there's the That's old, creepy. there's like the actual, like old, you know, cause it's an airplane with a the bathroom. There's like the old toilet there and like bunks and like, it's, it was the wildest thing ever. So yeah, that's crazy. So damn. Yeah. So sometimes well, I would never have done that on purpose, but I I love that memory, and it also freaked me out heavily. <laughs> I'll have to go back and watch that one. I don't think I've seen that one. Yeah, I think it was um, a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Damn, dude, that is creepy. I thought you were gonna say maybe that there was like gonna be like eyes, you know, the classic eyes no. that at night, which I'm sure you've experienced. I feel like everyone who's hiked oh, yeah. has experienced that at some point, but um. 
a wrecked plane mm-hmm. just coming into view so close like that. Yeah, no, yeah, that would be, like not a Cessna, but like something the size of a sixteen wheeler. Like a that's yeah. crazy. Damn, I got to look into this one. Yeah, um, that's pretty cool. Do you remember it's where Mount it was Success. originating from? It, Mount Success um, by Berlin. They just I'm sorry. Did you do you remember where the plane? I remember Mount Success. Oh, where it was coming the AT from? AT goes over it, like you said. Yeah. And I was like about to leave New Hampshire, enter the final state, and I was like, Mount Success. But no, my uh, <laughs> my question was, yeah, do you remember like where the, the plane was like going to or from or anything like that? It originated from Boston General. I think back then it was Laconia Airport or something like that. It was a super short hop. So it was um, it was it was Boston to Berlin. And it was oh, okay. probably only twelve people on board. Um and a lot of them survived. It, it was it was winter when they went as well, which is what made it like extra creepy for me because I had read oh, yeah. I had read all this stuff. So they crashed and nobody knew where they were. It it took a couple days to get them out. A couple oh, of them, wow. A couple perished and the rest of them kind of made do. The plane was completely broken apart and it was below freezing in snow. They put the fire out in the fuselage by just throwing snow at it. Yeah, it's wild. Damn. Yeah. I gotta look into this. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. <laughs> so on that dark note. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's that. No, this stuff fascinates me. I mean, you look at the the direction my main channel's gone. Like that should come as no surprise. Well, um, that's true. You're like the Dateline NBC of uh, backpacking, <laughs> by the way. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, th- I'm thinking like that could be an interesting video you for myself to go. Like, I've had the idea to go and like go hike out to a plane crash for a while for a video. I mean, I've, I've been to various ones, but usually like small like Cessnas and stuff that are pretty close to the main trail. So yeah, that would be interesting for sure. Um, dude, what a, what a fun episode, Sean, uh, where can, where can people go see your stuff if they haven't, which they probably have, but if they haven't, I'm, I'm, I'm just pretty much a hundred percent on YouTube. Um, just no, no TikTok, dude. What are you? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I can't dance. Um, <laughs> I do have Instagram uh, account that I occasionally post to, uh, but everything is under syntax seventy seven s i n t a x seven seven on YouTube. Yeah, man, and the website too, right? Yeah, dot com. You got. Uh, it. I'll have a link to. Uh, I'll have a link to that stuff in the description. Sean, thank you, man. Yeah, thank and, you. Um, Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Um, if you enjoyed this and you enjoyed the show, dude, five star reviews are the classic thing. Subscribing, like you should do all that stuff. But I really want to harp today on just telling a friend if you like the show. Um, that's the best way to grow it. It really is. Tell a friend, someone, especially a new backpacker, or you're going to be dragging your friend out this summer, you're getting ready or something. Share this with them. Um, or just someone you know who's thinking about getting into backpacking or something. I would really appreciate that. And I will see you guys next week. Woohoo!